Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a compelling look into the web of connections between French sculpture and US history. I was prepared to be overwhelmed the first time I visited the online database for the census of French sculpture in American public collections. It is a massive project encompassing thousands of sculptures which were created over a span of 460 years. Instead, I found many old friends, including some of my favorite works from the Nasher collection, as well as a number of surprising and moving histories. Today's program, in addition to offering an introduction to the project, will tease out some of the fascinating stories revealed by a close look at artworks in the census. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Laura de Marjorie, director of the French Sculpture Census, who will share the history of how this ambitious project came to be. Laura's presentation will be followed by three vignettes featuring highlights from the census. First of these will be presented by Dr. Richard Brittel, who will speak on the subject of Paul Gauguin. Brittel is founding director of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History, Margaret McDermott Distinguished Chair of Aesthetic Studies, and co-director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Museums at UTD. Next, Amélie Semier, director of the Brudel and Zadkine Museums, Paris, will present on works by Émile Antoine Brudel that were discovered in Des Moines, Iowa. And finally, Nasher chief curator Jed Morse will offer a perspective on the history of sculptural works found in Dallas's own Fair Park. We will conclude our afternoon with a panel discussion among all four of our guests and an opportunity for questions from the audience. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the woman at the center of this remarkable undertaking. Please join me in welcoming Laura de Marjorie. I would like to thank the Nasher Sculpture Center and its director, Jeremy Strick, for organizing today's panel. I've been working closely with Nasher staff for the web launch of the French Sculpture Census and for today's panel. The Nasher is blessed with the most efficient and friendly team, and it has been a great pleasure to work with each of them. I would like to thank especially Anna Smith, Curator of Education, for today's panel, and Jacques Abba, the Digital Communication Specialist, who has, with great skill, been responsible for the web launch. I have also a special thank to um, someone who sits here on the first row, who is the uh, representative of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Sylvie Christophe, who is the cultural attaché at the French consulate in Houston. And I'm very happy she, she's here. I would like, um, yeah, thank you. I would like to give you some insights on the origins of um, the French sculpture census. The habit of chasing sculpture began for me in 1978 when I started working at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. I was in charge of 10,000 sculptors' files, and those were in the brown boxes that you can see there. 2,000 sculpture object files and 2,000 medal files. This is the archive center. It was designed by um, the Italian architect Guy Aulenti. And um, so those were the files on 19th century artists. With the sculpture curators Anne Pinjot and Antoinette Lenormand, we built up a very important photographic archive these uh, wooden boxes were in my office, so this is a view of my office at the Musée d'Orsay, and they contain an estimated 100,000 photographs that were sorted by locations. This extremely rich resource is open to the public and was built with a strong commitment to public access. My great luck is to build the French sculpture census in the computer age, and even now in the digital image age. The second model for the French sculpture census was at home. My husband, Olivier Mellet, when he was a curator in charge of British, American, and Spanish paintings at the Musée du Louvre, created a database of American art in French public collections named Lafayette. And uh, of course, <laughs> and as soon as um, possible, he also made it available with free access online. I first had the idea for the French sculpture census in a very special situation. In 2001, 
a few months after having left the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts, where I had just spent a year as a fellow at the Clark Art Institute, I came back as a courier for the Musée d'Orsay. And I arrived on September 10, 2011. Next day, you know what happened, the tragedy. And you may also remember that there was no flight between um, the US and Europe for more or less a week. And it was especially difficult if you had to travel not by yourself, but with crates, with Monet's and Cezanne's. <laughs> so after a few days, um, you know, totally under the shock, I started to um, take advantage of the fact that I was in one of the best art libraries in the country. And I started going to the shelves and doing a census of French 19th century, because I was working at the Musée d'Orsay, sculpture in American museums. I eventually flew back to Paris, told my colleagues um, about the census, and they said, oh, it's a great idea, but please don't leave us again, because I had been gone for one year. So I put the census on the shelf on my office and did not touch it for eight years. Besides those origins, I realized only recently that my personal history and my family history were also a strong inspiration. Whether you believe or not in cell memory, something must be in my genes that draws me to the US. First, there was this amazing <laughs> cross-country trip I made in 1972 in an Airstream trailer. I suppose you know, all of you know what an Airstream trailer was or is. And this trip was organized by the, um, a foundation called the Wally Byam Foundation. I think Mr. Wally Byam was the uh, builder of the Airstreams. And Wally Byam wanted to promote friendship between nations. Vast program. So we were a caravan of 20 trailers. And uh, you can see the trip we made. And this trip certainly gave me a sense of the size of the country and of the fact that this country is not limited to its main cities. The only museum we visited, I think, was Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming. <laughs> But in, we visited places such as La Crosse, Wisconsin, La Crosse in French, or uh, the Corn Palace in Mitchell, South Dakota. <laughs> and, but at that point, I was not yet chasing sculpture. The variety of places we visited is reflected in the wide variety of locations listed in the census. And these are just a few examples of the 300-something locations that are in the French sculpture census. And as you can see um, from on the bottom list, there is a, a very um, funny, in a way, um, variety of places. Um, hotel, station, Masonic temple, uh, lighthouse, or all sorts of places. But then there are also family links. As you can see from my 1972 trip and my 2000-2001 stay in Williamstown, US was not terra incognita when we moved here in 2009. There was also before that a long story of links between my family and the US. In my family, in my father's family, you have three generations in a row of diplomats. And um, my parents have been posted twice. My father is the guy laughing on the left, and this is very much him. <laughs> and um, my, my mother and, and father are here uh, in front of Claude Monet's house in, in Giverny. Uh, before that, uh, my grandparents and their children crossed the country as I did later, but in a train, uh, in 1940, when they took a boat from France to the East Coast, train from the East Coast to the West Coast, and then another boat to China, 
where they uh, spent six more years after 1940. And if you go back a little bit more, in 1903, my grandparents, my great-grandparents were posted to the US. And um, here you see them vacationing in a place where the people from Washington would often go called Manchester by the sea and uh, on the East Coast. So even more important than those links is the fact that these three generations of diplomats were exercising their job with the idea that they were meant to build bridges between France and the US to bring a better understanding between the two countries and to help promote French culture in the US. And these goals are very much what inspires me in the French sculpture census. If you go even further back, I have an American great, 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 great grandfather <laughs> who was Abraham Redwood, the founder in 1747 of the first public library in Newport, Rhode Island, still operating today. With those links and inspiration, we're back at the beginning at the Musée d'Orsay, free access, sharing information, being a go-between. In 2009, before we moved to Dallas, I decided to revive the project begun eight years before. I submitted my idea to Professor Rick Patel. You all know him, you know how enthusiastic a person he is. He found the idea interesting. He quickly obtained the Dean's agreement to host the French Sculpture Census at UT Dallas, and he found money for a part-time salary. He really made the whole project come to life. Director Jeremy Strick had offered me a desk at the National Sculpture Center. After a few months, he offered something which was much more than a desk. He offered to fund and host the web version of the French Sculpture Census. Since the beginning, my aim was to transfer the database to the internet. Jeremy made it possible, and without the Nash's support, the whole endeavor would not have been worth doing. I'm very happy to express publicly and repeatedly my gratitude to Rick Patel and Jeremy Strick for their continuous support. I now have six partners, the two American that I just mentioned, and four French partners, the INHA, National Institute for Art History, the Musée d'Orsay, the Musée Rodin, and the École du Louvre, and I hope you will appreciate the fact that the sculpture for the partner page is a partner couple. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, it's interesting, I asked Laura, this is a, um, by uh, Dalu. Dalu, and it's uh, the marble version, which is in the Clark Art Institute, and I asked her that because I bought the plaster version, which is in the Art Institute of Chicago, when I was the curator there, so I, I was thinking, aha, I brought this to America, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what do I do? Does it work? No. No, that's not it. Well, amongst all of these things, there may be a Gauguin. No, there's not. <laughs> there is not a Gauguin. Ah, oh. now I'm talking about an artist who is represented by, at this point, 25 works in the French Sculpture Census and will be represented by many more works as the French Sculpture Census goes more deeply into even smaller American museums, which it will. And I'm talking about an artist who, in many ways, you don't think of as a sculptor. Um, and one of the interesting things about the census is that you actually learn about the varieties of sculpture by Gauguin. And one of the things that you would learn is if this thing didn't have a label, you would never guess it was by Gauguin. You would think it was by some academic French sculptor in the middle or later 19th century. And it's in fact um, one of only two marble sculptures which he made. Um, many historians of sculpture think that he actually didn't make them, that they were made by a professional sculptor to his designs because he never before or never after um, carved in marble. But given Gauguin's incredible skill 
at taking new mediums and making them his own, which he did throughout his life. I think it's actually likely that he did carve this, a portrait of his son, one of his children, um, by his, uh, uh, his wife, who he also sculpted in stone. And this is at the Metropolitan Museum. But to think of the variety of Gauguin as a sculpture, you have to go from New York to California. This is a sculpture by Gauguin that was recently purchased by the J. Paul Getty Museum. And it was a rather courageous um, purchase because many scholars of Gauguin don't think that he made it. They think that it's a, a, an object that he purchased and put on a base. He later uses it in various and sundry other works of art. But they thought that without ever having seen it, because the sculpture was essentially lost, except in photographic forms, until it was acquired by the Getty. And as soon as you see this object, you know that Gauguin made it. So we have two sculptures in the sculpture census, a, a, one in um, marble and one in wood, um, which one would doubt were made by Gauguin, but now we know that they were. The varieties of Gauguin as a sculptor is, are, are extraordinary. And this is a sculpture which is across the street in the Reeves collection in the DMA. It's a vase in the form of a head of a woman. The woman has always been identified probably incorrectly as Madame Schuffenecker. Um, and it was a flower vase. It had, he put flowers from, coming out of her head. And you can see in a rather ghoulish fashion her fingers coming down, fixing her hair in the back of her head on the other side of it. Um, it was probably uh, uh, fired and um, uh, uh, painted by Gauguin with help from others because he was learning um, how to sculpt and how to glaze ceramics at this point in time. And this is one of the most important ceramic sculptures by Gauguin in America. And fortunately, it's here. Now, the masterpiece of Gauguin's sculpture, um, probably the masterpiece of Gauguin's sculpture, is fortunately in America. Um, and we can go see it, and it's been in a public collection for many, many years, for more than half century, in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. It's a huge, heavy, thick, hand-carved, hand-sanded, and painted um, sculpture made by Gauguin in 1889, um, two years before he goes to Tahiti. And it has its little title in gilded letters at the top, um, which translates to be loving, you will be happy. And you sort of look at this and you think, well, who's happy here? Uh, and who's loving here? We have a nude woman. And this is Gauguin himself, if you can see him up here, with his thumb in his mouth, his um, incredible nose, which, of which he was inordinately proud, um, uh, eyes pressing down, and then his hand grabbing the arm of the woman um, who is nude and beautifully finished and burnished, and then all sorts of figures of death and age and various things that are very difficult to find. These um, tendrils or branches which have yet to be identified this is a work of art that raises more questions than it gives us answers and is uh, indicative of Gauguin's finest. But Gauguin's sculpture isn't always limited to things that look like sculpture. In fact, he made many objects of use. Um, this is a recently acquired chest carved by Gauguin and his friend Emile Bernard um, in the Art Institute of Chicago, um, which represents the, the, the earthly paradise, the paradise on earth, and which housed probably books um, when it was made in 1888 and 1889. And it's a work of art that's only now being decoded by the Art Institute because it was never published even in color um, before its new um, to the world, and the French Sculpture Center is, census makes it available to all of us. Or this Eve Noir, Black Eve, um, which is about this tall, and which is in the National Gallery of uh, Washington, is one of two enormous and very important and very disturbing sculptures made in ceramic by Gauguin um, before he goes to Tahiti. Um, the other in a museum on Long Island, which is yet to be accessed by Laura, but she tells me she'll get there by next year. Um, and so you'll be able to see yet another one. What the, on the left is a, a really great and enigmatic French uh, sculpture by Gauguin, which is in the Nasher, an object which was carved by Gauguin from a single um, piece of wood and then beheaded by Gauguin and then reattached 
by Gauguin with little dribs and drabs of other things and a piece of iron on the back so that it could hang on the wall as well as sit on a, on a chair, a sculpture which is uh, uh, so bizarre in terms of scale, in terms of meaning, um, in terms of its real relationship to the history of sculpture, that the only place it really fits beautifully is in the light of the Nasher. And I show you a sculpture on the right, and I, and I chose it deliberately because it's a type of sculpture by Gauguin that exists in numerous versions. And that, that is, it's essentially a fake. This is a sculpture which is cast in bronze from a wood original. And Volar, the great dealer, cast almost all of Gauguin's wooden sculptures in bronze after Gauguin's death. And those bronze objects are in much greater profusion in the world's museums and private collections than the originals. And so here you see an original object, and here you see a patinated to look like wood bronze reproduction of a work of art which is in the National Gallery of Canada. I want to end with the only sculpture that was commissioned by Gauguin, and it's uh, from Gauguin, and it's also in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and it was com commissioned from an extraordinary man, a collector and writer um, whose name was Gustave Fayet, and who was one of the great sensibilities of France in the, early, in the first decade um, of the 20th century. It represents war and peace, and the theme, the, the subject of the sculpture was actually given to Gauguin by Fayet, and Gauguin actually, uncharacteristically for him, did what he was told because he admired Fayet, and he actually made one sculpture of war and one sculpture of peace, and Fayet received them from Gauguin before Gauguin's death in 1903. So in America, one has the finest sculpture by Gauguin um, at, the, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the last and only commissioned sculpture by Gauguin also at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Thanks. Let me just say as an introduction that I'd like to, to thank the Nasher's Culture Center for inviting me there. And thanks, uh, um, it's, I was telling um, my colleagues that it's one of my favorite museums as a sculpture specialist too. Um, the census also tells us tales about collectors that once collected French works and that eventually became in, uh, came into public viewing. And thanks to Bronze Edition, there are works by Antoine Bourdel, who was a major French sculptor from the turn of the 20th century, from LA to Tokyo, from Cape Town to Helsinki. And the French sculpture census has revealed that many collectors of Bourdel, who, by the way, was also a teacher and had many American students, especially female students, um, and I guess that the United States might well have the largest collection of works by Bordel outside France. One of the many, many fascinating stories the census and law have revealed is um, that of the Des Moines, am I saying it right? The Des Moines, Iowa Bordels. Uh, Annie Barbera, who's our archivist at the Musée Bordel, and Laure de, Mar and, and Laure de Marche, he have written about it. So between 1923 and 1928, this gentleman, who's Carl Weeks, and his wife, Edith von Slyke, had a big mansion built in Des Moines after King's House in Salisbury, England, and they named it Salisbury House. That's the house over there. Carl Weeks had established a major cosmetic company, which you probably have hardly heard of, um, and it was called the Armand Company, as you hear the, the French slightly old-fashioned sound of the name, in 1916. By 1927, the company's annual income exceeded that of Elizabeth Arden or Helena Rubinstein. So the um, um, house had to be furnished with their art collection, with the art collection the couple were constituting. And... Um, the, let me get back to, to there. The general, the, the few um, photographs Law has unearthed, unearthed thanks to um, the colleagues at Salisbury House, show that there's a typical mixture of medieval 17th century, 18th century, 19th century objects, but the couple was also major collectors of books. 
amongst which very daring contemporary choices, as Joyce's Ulysses, and you have to remember that we were in the 20s, and D. H. Lawrence's Lady Chatelet's Lovers, both done at the time. For contemporary sculpture, what is very surprising is that it seems they also had the same eagle eye. And I'm wondering whether we should attribute it to the influence of Edith von Slyke, Mrs. Weeks, who used to be a student of art in Paris before getting married. And so both bought, chose works of Bordel after a major show at Galerie d'Anton in Paris in 1928. The, um, 1929, sorry. The two Bordel they chose are masterpieces. They haven't aired at all. The first one of it is the one you see reproduced on the catalogue over there, which is the head of Apollo, 1909. There it is. 1909, a version of which, without base, had been exhibited at the 1913 Armory Show in New York and is an absolute landmark in sculpture and certainly one of my own favorites in the Musée Bordel. The head was once a sketch in clay that Bordel did and he didn't cook it, it was on fire and so it slowly deteriorated inside the Paris studio. Years later, Bordel rediscovered it, it and its beautiful, antique-like, decaying aspect. So to preserve it, to keep it, he had it molded, then cast as a mask, and decided to preserve the seams, which you can just see on the face, the seams of the mold on the surface, and the signs of wear and tear of the passing of time. He was then an assistant of, to Rodin, carving some of his marbles, and he offered him a version of the mask. At the, same time, at the same time he left Rodin studio practice to pursue fully his own career, he then developed this version of Apollo, that's the head on that particular base, which is a very schematic, prismatic base of a near cubist appearance, and you have to think we're in 1909, early on. And that's a sure sign he was strongly distancing himself from the influence of Rodin. Now, you had noticed the little head of Apollo that was outside Salisbury House, and that's inside, so you see amongst medieval works, 17th century works, where there's that Rodin bust, which is very modern of appearance, if you come to think of it. So, 1909 also, and a cast um, of the foundry Alexis Rudier, um, that head of Rodin, Bordel also modeled once he had left Rodin, and it's one of his of various versions of portraits bust of the master that the younger artist modeled as a homage to the old master. Far from being a realistic portrait, it is a rendering of what Bordel called his inner life. And the style is this time definitely estranged to that of Rodin. The volumes are geometrical and what Bordel called l'assemblage des profils, the assemblage of profiles, which was one of the teachings of Rodin, mingles very well with the masterful simplification which will be the brand mark of Bordel's works to come. Both works originally were produced into that sort of studio, a very typical Parisian studio, so that's on the left-hand side, his studio around 1907, so two years before the modeling of the originals of the head of Apollo and the bust of Rodin. And you see the young artist, rather elegant with his first wife. And then the second photo is the same studio when Bordel is a better known, a very no, well-known sculptor then, with the famous Hercules archer that you do recognize. And so both works deal somehow with Bordel's liberation from the influence of the master, both proclaim the new way he'll be developing in the last 20 years of his career, where he will be mainly a, sculpt a sculptor for monumental works and monuments mainly. As a, just to finish this, this, um, sli this, uh, small, this talk, I'll just mention that if ever you come to Paris or and if you don't know the Musée Bordel, it is one of the few remaining artist studios near Montparnasse which is worth seeing because it still 
keeps something of the, the, the period of the time, and it's, so it's worth seeing the works there. But the, cent the census brings us and uh, helps us show and, um, um, and helps us circulate the work, the work of Bordel heaps better than, than if there was, uh, um, how could I say that? The, the census helps us um, travel without uh, being able to go to Paris or being able to travel all around the state. The census helps us traveling around with the website. And so it's a wonderful achievement to us all. So, so far we have heard of the breadth of uh, the French sculpture census, the great works of art that have come to reside in the United States that are now um, part of our national uh, heritage uh, and are preserved in museums around the country. Um, we have heard of some of the wonderful details that have been unearthed thanks to uh, Laura's work on the French Sculpture Census. And one of the uh, parts of the French Sculpture Census that, that I wanted to highlight was uh, an aspect on the website. Let's see if I can, oops, okay. So uh, I, I had to, there was a, I wanted to show you an image of the website itself. So you, you had a sense of what it looked like, but. Mine. Oh, it was. That was the one that okay, then we'll, for, we'll so you, you might have caught a glimpse of it. Um, but the, um, what, one of the uh, headings is Spotlight. And if you click on that, there are um, a, a number of, of works that are highlighted um, among the thousands that are part of the sculpture census. Um, and one of the spotlights is placed on our own Fair Park here in Dallas, Texas. So um, the, this extraordinary compendium of French sculpture in the United States not only includes masterpieces in museums, um, but also works of public art um, that, that reveals the French among us. Um, Many who have gone to the State Fair, um, I'm sure, have blithely walked by uh, the works of art um, in anticipation of um, cotton candy or a corny dog. Um, and, uh, uh, but there are um, some pretty extraordinary works of art out there, um, some of which were created by French artists who, um, who had come to the United States not soon before uh, the creation of the, the, of, of the 1936 Texas Centennial Celebration. So uh, two artists, uh, uh, um, and R uh, Raul Jose, and um, being in Texas, one might be forgiven for thinking that the name underneath that is Jose Martin, but in fact it is Jose Martin. <laughs> so these two artists, um, uh, who had recently moved to uh, the United States from France, um, found themselves uh, at the, um, in Dallas in 1936, um, creating uh, seven sculptures for the 1936 Texas Centennial Celebration, uh, two of which you see here, uh, the Spirit of the Centennial and this wonderful uh, fish fountain. Um, you may recognize this sculpture as being one that is in front of the Women's Museum. It was initially created for the Pavilion of Government, um, which is what, uh, what the, the building uh, uh, is now occupied by the Women's Museum was created for uh, in 1936. Um, that one of the wonderful aspects of the spotlight section of the uh, website is that it contains um, lots of wonderful details um, about uh, whatever is being highlighted in that section. So, for example, um, uh, you know, you, you may notice that, of course, this, this figure is standing on a cactus. Um, it, but as, so she's clearly the spirit of something, because if a figure were actually standing on a cactus, that would be extraordinarily painful. <laughs> The other um, uh, little detail, which is really wonderful, is that the model for this figure is a young Georgia Carroll, who later became a noted fashion model and actress. Did anybody know Georgia Carroll growing up in Dallas, Texas? Me neither. So um, one of the threads that seems to be running through our presentations is, uh, is the extraordinary figure of Emile Antoine Bourdel. Um, 
uh, Raoul José um, and uh, José Martin both trained uh, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Uh, Martin dropped out because um, he uh, had to make some money to support his young family. Um, and afterwards, uh, Raoul José um, uh, apprenticed with Emile Antoine Bourdel, so trained in Bourdel's studio for a time. Um, they uh, moved to the U.S. in 1927 um, because they were hired by uh, the owner of the Northwestern Terracotta Company in Chicago, who wanted to modernize the kinds of uh, terracotta wares that he was making. Um, and uh, uh, both of them worked on the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, and it was there um, that they, uh, it was that experience and the recommendation of the chief architect for that fair, uh, Donald Nelson, um, that brought them to Dallas. So uh, Donald Nelson, who was the chief architect for the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, got a call from his friend uh, George Dahl, who was the chief architect for the Texas Centennial in 1936, asking, who might you recommend to create uh, sculptures and uh, architectural ornamentation for our Texas Centennial? And he recommended um, not only um, Raoul José and, and, um, and uh, José Martin, but also uh, Pierre Bourdel, who we will get to later. Um, so some other sculptures that, of, of the seven that uh, José and Martin created were uh, the figures of France, Mexico, and the United States that are now in front of the Automobile Pavilion, which uh, was formerly the Pavilions of Electricity, Communications, and Industry in 1936. Some of you may remember that many of the buildings, original buildings in Fair Park, burned down in 1942 and were, were, were later rebuilt. Um, one, one, another wonderful uh, detail that is presented in the website is a quote from Raoul José about the figure of France. And uh, he says that in, uh, quote, in order to add a little spice to the severity of the figure, I placed a bunch of grapes in her left hand to illustrate the abundance and good cheer of the nation. Um, I, I also wonder if this might uh, be a reference to um, the connection between North Texas and France and the role that Denison, Te Texas played in saving the French viticulture industry uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So perhaps something to that. Um, oh, there she is. And there's Mexico. And there's the US. So the, uh, the other uh, 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 member of this French trio uh, who were recommended from the Chicago World Fair uh, is Pierre Bourdel, who has a very intimate connection to Emile Antoine Bourdel. Pierre is his son. Um, he uh, created uh, 10 bas reliefs uh, for the 1936 Texas Centennial. Uh, the one that you see here is Man and Eagle, or alternately, alternately titled Locomotive Power, um, one of four that were made for the Pavilion of Transportation. Um, which is now, uh, I believe, maybe the Automobile Pavilion. Uh, no, it's the Centennial Pavilion, pardon me. Um, and uh, um, there is, again, also a very helpful note um, in, uh, in, this, in, this, in this spotlight on Fair Park, um, distinguishing uh, Bourdel's technique um, as something uh, very particular um, bas relief is probably a, a, a general way to describe it in that these are um, kind of low relief um, uh, sculptures that are painted, but in, in fact, it's more akin to a technique called the cameo relief, where um, a, a, uh, a colored layer of cement is then covered over in another covered layer of cement and then carved away while the cement is still wet to reveal uh, the color, the, the contrasting color underneath. Um, so uh, like um, José and Martin, um, uh, Pierre Bourdel came to the United States um, initially to work in, in the late 1920s um, and returned to France, came back, and actually became a US citizen, as did José and Martin in 1934. 
Um, as I mentioned, he also worked in the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And, um, and in fact, after coming to Texas in 1936, um, he later sculpted with José Martin a series of uh, bas-reliefs for the Baylor Medical Alumni Library in Dallas. Um, all of these artists, uh, interestingly enough, fought in World War II as well. Um, and um, Bourdel fought initially for the French Resistance and then for the US once the US entered the war. Um, and after his uh, foray in Texas, he later had commissions in New York and Washington, D.C., in Mexico and Haiti. And the reason that I know all of this is there are extensive biographies of each one of these artists um, in the spotlight on, uh, on uh, Fair Park. Um, so what happened after um, uh, their, uh, their work at, at Fair Park in 1936? José, uh, Raúl José went to New York, uh, but returned to Dallas in 1948. He established a studio on Fairmont Street, exhibited at the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, and was eventually elected a member of the National Academy of Design, um, a huge honor at the time. And um, José Martin stayed in Dallas um, and um, made a life here, um, lived here as a working artist until 1985 when he passed away. And, um, and actually made a number of works that are in, in prominent uh, public locations, such as the Lakewood Theater, Scottish Rite Hospital, and the University Park Methodist Church. So um, one of the things that we, we've seen how uh, the, uh, the, the French sculpture census is of great benefit to scholars of uh, French sculpture, um, and particularly if they're interested in French sculpture in the United States. Um, but it also has a resonant interest for the layperson um, who might just want to know um, how that, all that stuff happened out at Fair Park in 1936. So uh, I think at this point we are moving on to our panel discussion. And so why don't we all come gather up on the stage? Thank you. <laughs> so. One of the interesting aspects of the French sculpture census, I think, is how it defines French. Because you will notice, if, as you go online and search, that there are artists such as Alberto Giacometti, uh, uh, Jacques Lipschitz, Anton Pablo Prinner. Picasso. Pablo Picasso. <laughs> um, names that may not sound very French. So um, uh, Laura, if you could talk about how you, how you define French. Yes, this is when I wear my bulletproof jacket. <laughs> <laughs> From the very beginning, I wanted to include rather than exclude. So um, it was very clear that I would include French-born artists, artists who had French citizenship. And this includes also French-born artists that left France. And I'll just give you two examples that you, um, that comes later, but that's okay. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that, thank you. <laughs> that um, that uh, came to the US and whom you all know, Gaston Lachaise, very French name. But uh, it's very interesting to note that when he came here, his first commissions were given to him because he was French and because he was French trained. So it does make sense, of course, um, including him. And the other one is Louise Bourgeois, who passed away not very long ago. And uh, she left France. She said that had she remained in France, she would not have become a sculptor. But she did um, still give French titles to her works while she was in the US. And so it does make sense to, to include French-born artists, even if they left France. I also include artists who came to France and took French citizenship. And there is an incredibly long list mm -hmm. of artists starting with Medardo Rosso or uh, Valoton, the Swiss artist, and going on with Brancusi, Pevsner, Zadkin, Lipschitz, and you could go on, Max Ernst, I mean, you could go on and on. So these are French 
citizens because they chose to become French citizens. And then there are artists who came to France and settled in France and created in France but never became French citizens. And this is exactly the case of Picasso and Giacometti. So uh, Picasso spent maybe except, I don't know, five years, but he spent you know, the greatest part of his uh, creative years in France. Um, his estate is in France, and I have no problem including Picasso, even if he was still very Spanish in, in, in some ways, in, um, in the census. Uh, same with Giacometti, who maybe went a bit further. I mean, he went back and forth, but he mainly worked in, in France. The interesting thing for me was um, no one really questioned my, my choice, but one day I, had a, I was um, exchanging with the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, asking, requesting images for their... French collection. And so they gave me this, they sent me very generously, uh, they waived all the fees, they sent me all the images, but some were missing. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I think you forgot Picasso and Giacometti. And then they answered and they said, um, we don't think they should belong to the census, so we will not give you the images. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this is very interesting. I regret of course, because it means that um, the images are not online. But I totally respect, and I think it's good to raise the question. And I much prefer to have people raising an eyebrow and saying, why is this artist there? Because I think also that when you're surprised, that's when you learn something, because it does speak to you. And as um, Jill Magnusson from the Nasher once said, it's, oh, it's all the French connection. And even if I'm not smuggling heroin to the US, <laughs> as in the 1971 movie, but it's, it's true, it's a French connection. And there are even American artists, um, such as Stores, who is a very interesting artist. And the Nasher has two, I think, beautiful pieces by, by Stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one, Herbert Hazeltine, an animal sculptor. And they, both of them came to France and they still had links, very close links to the US, but they settled in France and maybe both of them, I don't remember, but died in France and their estate is in France. So it's a very open and, and um, understanding of French. And I think it's, it's better to be, to, to, to include more than, than to exclude. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question just generally and, and one that comes up a lot um, when, you're, when you're dealing with, mm -hmm. um, you know, artists of the, the 19th, late, particularly the late 19th and 20th centuries um, because, um, you know, the notion of, of, uh, of, uh, of an artist's nationality um, uh, is, is diminished somewhat by the fact that they move around so much. So much. Yeah. Yes. Um, so one, one of the other um, uh, issues that, that actually Rick highlighted in, in his talk is the, you know, you, the, the, uh, the issue of, um, of that you include posthumous casts in, uh, in the French sculpture census. And, um, I can understand as a compendium of information the, the, and the desire not to exclude um, why that certainly is. But there are, there are also reasons of French law and French history that, that would, um, that would uh, argue for including those as well. Yes, for, uh, posthumous casts are legal. And I think um, Amélie, being the head of the Musée Bourdel, has a very interesting perspective on, on this because she casts still, as does the Musée Hodan, a number of museums that have the rights, of, uh, that inherit the rights, the moral rights of the, of the artist. As um, posthumous casts, as, as the law was saying, are considered as original, provided they are answer to two definitions. There's a fiscal definition that was given rather late in the 20th century by the Code General des Impôts, the Taxation Code, um, in 1967, where it defined um, that it had to be an original bronze with 12 original editions, numbered one to eight, and then four artist proof. 
And then there was a legal definition, which is even more recent, that was given by the Cour de Cassation, which is France's highest court of appeal. And here are the, the elements that are very interesting. The bronze must be cast from a model in plaster or terracotta. And Rick was showing a model in wood, wood. and that's one difference. Mm -hmm. So a model in plaster or terracotta executed by the artist. Then it's an original bronze if it is a limited edition. And this is, by the way, something that Bordel did since the 20s. So very early on, he decided to limit his editions to 10. And then the cast must be strictly identical to the work approved by the artist. And uh, our own experience in the Musée Bordel that belongs to the city of Paris and who's the holder of Bordel's moral rights um, is that um, we've decided to be very open on that subject because it is a um, subject of discussion also in France. Do we include an art posthumous bronzes? To us, they are original as well as the anthemous bronzes, the bronzes done during the life of the artist. And, but I'm a strong advocate that museums put on their labels very clearly the date of the model, the original model in clay or plaster, the date of the bronze that was cast, and the name of the founder, if known. All that you have to know. It, it so happens that the Bordel family was there where the museum is till 2002. Great luck. And that they were very concerned with edition, and so that they kept files on every edition that they were doing. So they didn't cast always with the same foundries, but they traced, mo they traced all the casts they were doing posthumously. And as it was Bordel's widow, then Bordel's daughter, they were casting till 2002, one feels very assured that they were um, very close to the will of the master, and that's what we're still doing. Yeah, you know, we, um, uh, in 2004, we um, convened a symposium that looked at variability in, in uh, modern sculpture and this idea that um, casting an edition, everything is exactly the same. And as part of that, we brought together four casts of Rodin's Age of Bronze, uh, the plaster from the Nasher collection, two uh, bronzes that were uh, made during Rodin's lifetime from American museum collections. No, it's it's oh, yeah. a chance by chance. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> no. and, uh, Sorry. <laughs> what, that was one of them from uh, 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 the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, and the other one from the, the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia. Um, and then one uh, which was a Musée Rodin cast, uh, so a, a cast that was made by the Musée Rodin after Rodin's death. Um, and they were all uh, arrayed in, in the lower level gallery, and we brought in um, scholars and curators and um, conservators and artists to have a dynamic discussion about you know, what, what do we see? Are there differences in these casts? And one of the things that, I, that was really interesting about including the posthumous cast from the Museo Hardin was that, um, is that it, it, it compared very favorably um, to uh, the, the lifetime cast. And, um, and I think it argues for um, the, the kind of responsibility, that, particularly that institutions um, uh, hold and the kind of uh, professionalism with which they approach that. Um, and, and of course, the knowledge, um, the objective knowledge of the artist and his practice that I think um, you know, uh, leads to often um, you know, really extraordinary examples being made posthumously. And one should not forget, as a number of you know, that the artist didn't follow, um, wasn't I mean, instrumental into casting, usually. Yeah especially in the 19th, 20th century, they just give the things to be cast. So there's no hand put on on them. So Yeah, often Rodin was not involved um, Nor in was the Bordel. casting of his object. He just chose his founder, and then he had total confidence, and he just checked the, eventual, the eventual global aspect in patina. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so uh, one, of the, one of the other um, things that, that the... The sculpture census doesn't deal with is is this notion of attribution, and e even if you you know that there's a question of it, 
Yes, this is very important. Um, I chose also not to question the attributions made by the owning collections, the owning institutions. Even if you knew they were suspect? If, <laughs> when, when I have a doubt, <laughs> I, what I do is um, sometimes, and I'm not an expert on you oh, know, everything. four centuries or five centuries of sculpture, I, I, I know on 19, I know quite a lot on 19th century, but not, not always the rest. But I know also the people who know. So uh, when I feel there is a problem, and it does happen a very few times, but it does happen, I go to the curator and I privately, and I, I tell him, and um, you know, at the Musée d'Orsay, we have in our files documents that show that for example, this work um, has not been accepted as a work by Carpeau, uh, by his daughter, Louise Clément Carpeau. And um, so I, I copied all the, the files at the Musée d'Orsay and gave it to the, uh, to the curator. And I told him, you know, maybe we could write attributed to Carpeau. And um, so he took the file and he read it and then he told me, why should I believe Carpo's daughter? <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> and so this, mm. is, this is the limit. Um, but you gave him the opportunity. I gave him the opportunity. And, and, uh, and what I want to do also is that, you know, sometimes I can work before, and, uh, but sometimes also publishing on the internet just makes things available. And the real experts, they can... It's their role now to go to the museums and talk to the curators and convince them. And for example, there are a number, a small number of Rodin in, in the census on the website that uh, make the Musée Rodin in Paris uncomfortable, to say the least. Mm -hmm. and, but the Musée Rodin in Paris knows that it's, their, it's its role to now go to the museum owning this Rodin piece and discuss with the museum and, and convince him. Um, for many reasons, I do not want to do that myself. First, as I said, I don't have the expertise. The other thing is that I could get in very bad trouble by saying to a museum, oh, uh, your piece is not uh, Rodin. I could get in really bad trouble because it, it has, you know, um, financial consequences, of course. So it's, it's not my role to do that. And this is why also um, I say I'm a go-between. I'm a bit more than a go-between, of course, Definitely. but it's, 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 uh, it's then to the experts to play and, and, and be in touch directly with the, with the uh, owning institutions. And this is also why in, on each record, each object on, on, uh, on, this, on the website, you have a direct link to the institution. So you can just by a click go to the institution and be in touch with the institution. It's it's I'm here to enhance. I'm here to give information. But the real person who should be uh, contacted is the owning institution. Yeah. yeah. Could I say something? Please. Um, it's it's easy to to focus on issues of who is a French artist and is the object real and are posthumous bronzes included, but that gets, um, f makes us forget about the real value of the census, which is that we have in the United States the most important um, distrib and best distributed cultural patrimony of any country. And because we don't have any sense ourselves of our cultural patrimony, we don't think of it as our cultural patrimony, there is no place where one can do what Lore has done um, with the category of French sculpture um, for all of the dispersed institutions in America. Um, and the contrast with France is great. If you go to, if you're interested in, in what's in French museums, there is a website um, accessible if you speak French um, to everybody in the world that's called Joconde, which is the French word for the Mona Lisa. Um, and on, on that website is virtually every object that is, has been photographed in every museum in France. And so there's a place, and because, it's, because France believes that what are in their museums are part of the patrimony of the people of France, 
We do not have that belief in the United States, unfortunately. Um, and our, our works of art are so dispersed that even their records are dispersed. And this idea of bringing together in virtual space a dispersed collection, which is of such importance um, to French art and to world art, and which is scattered all across the length and breadth of this country, is something which is really important. And it sort of matters less whether Picasso was French or Spanish, and whether the, the Degas bronze or the Gauguin bronze was cast during the lifetime of the artist, than that there is access to what, how many objects now? 7,000. 7,000 objects in how many institutions? 300. So, I mean, it's this sheer, and, and, and this is the first pass. Five <laughs> years of her work with lots of interns and lots of help, but it's something that no American has as yet done. And I think she should get a huge hand of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Well said. I, and I, th I think that's probably a, a good place for us to uh, maybe open it up for yes. a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah, sir, in the back. Yes. 27 years ago, during the presidency of Francois Mitterrand, your father was the envoy to Washington, D.C., ambassador to the United States. Mayor Annette Strauss hosted an event called Ambassador Weekend. He came to Dallas. And at that time, I was Mayor Strauss Protocol Officer. And my heart is pumping. I see it, I see it to his left, and we, we, we talk about Alexis the Cockfield, the most I've seen. So I just want to tell you that's, that's 27 late, years later, you are a Dallas. That's very sweet of you, sir. Very sweet. Thank you. And I must tell you, we still have in our house in, in Gascony the. Um, Texas Almanac, uh, something uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was given by the mayor to my father. And we still, you know, we, we have it <laughs> because he kept a lot of things. And, and so, um, yes. And, and the first time I came to Dallas, no, sorry. First time I came to Texas uh, was in 1986 uh, with my parents who then went to Fort Worth. And um, we didn't come to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> it's that Kimball thing. We know, yeah. we know. <laughs> so, so this was my first step in, in, um, in, in Texas was, uh, was Fort Worth. And I think, I think the museum was, the DMA was... In, in between. Fair, in between, yeah. Yes, in yeah. between. So because my father was very much a museum person, so he, um, you know, he would have come if he had, could see uh, a museum. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank sir? Uh, in what regard is the work of Camille Cordell held in France? Oh, very great regard now because um, there has been at least two major exhibitions or maybe even three about Camille Claudel, one or two at the Musée Rodin, uh, one in Poitiers, in the museum in, in Poitiers, and good news, there will be very soon a musée Camille Claudel, which will be opened in the... Burgundy, East Eastern, East, 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 yeah, East Eastern of Burgundy, Eastern France. So she's very well recognized. She had a, there was a very interesting show, I would say maybe six years ago in um, Canada and in Detroit of uh, Rodin and Camille Claudel together with a very interesting catalog. So, so she, she's very well regarded. My wife and I recently had the pleasure touring the museum, Rodin Museum, and beautiful garments. Yes. And I looked for her work, and I didn't see any. Well, well it is the Musée Rodin. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. No, no, but there are, there are some at the Musée Rodin. The Musée Rodin is uh, currently We're... under renovation. So the whole, the whole installation is uh, a little bit maybe um, different from usual, but, but 
but there are, there are some at the Musée Rodin. And if it was a very recent visit, there was a huge Camille Claudel show at Roubaix, north of France, and so the works might well have been all lent over there. So that's another possibility. Yes, which just closed a week just ago. Just a week yeah. ago, yeah. right. Yes, sir. I was wondering, and by the way, I think it's very important to have shows that show the great friendship that actually predates the French. We have had a lot of people that fairly recently moved to Dallas and studied with a group called the Neals in Houston. They don't know once you leave this like magnificent bubble here in the arts history that we had such a close relationship and even ideas like entrepreneurs understand what we have here like in France. What was some of the response? I'm sure being out there, the, uh, because you know. The response is, I can't tell you how nice it is. <laughs> I can't tell you how well, how well I am um, welcomed when, when I go to American museums. Um, I don't physically go always to all of the 300 locations because <laughs> I need to work, but but uh, when I go and and through emails, I, I work a lot, of course, through emails, and I've been in touch maybe now with, you know, close to a thousand persons, and the response is always very open, very warm. I would say for two reasons, or maybe three reasons: sculpture, and um, Jeremy knows that, and Jed know, and we all know that sculpture is not the first field being studied, and you need to sometimes to battle for sculpture. So even among American museums, the sculpture collection has not always been very much studied. So they are happy that someone pays attention. And um, when I study a, a museum collection, I usually it's a sort of win-win situation, which means that I benefit from the information they give me. But I also, in return, uh, if I see that something needs um, additional information, um, I would give you an example. Once I was cataloging um, medals, and, and the medal was um, signed with a monogram, which is just you know a few a few letters. And for me, I could read it as I, I knew immediately who the artist was, but that museum did not know. So I I, I do send. Um, not always, but some often a, a list of additional information to, to, to the collection. And so the welcome is really very, very warm and, and excellent. And maybe also because I do feel that there is a, a close link between the Fr France and the US, so it's, it's both. What would this show how be received in France? Very well received. I think we have gone... We, we, we are uh, after the point when um, French citizens were a little bit uh, sad to see their patrimony gone to the U.S. This certainly exists. But it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good it's thing. It's a good yes. thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. And, and um, actually, there was a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, I don't know, a, a very important show in the major... Um, place in Paris where you have shows, which is the Grand Palais, and um, a very important French art historian uh, called Pierre Rosenberg, who was the director of the Louvre, uh, organized a show of French paintings in American collections. Mm -hmm. And this was very successful and very interesting and very unknown to French audience. And of course, uh, I do have in my mind, back in my mind, a similar show with, with um, Ameri you know, French Absolutely. sculpture from American collections that could be traveled to France and, and the US. Well, it helps you. I had a seminal life change at the Rodin Museum. Oh. <laughs> my first house. Oh. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, Augustus uh, Godin. Saint Godin's. Where does he picture in all of this? Because he has. 
he is from French descent, but he is not included in the census because he did not really spend time working in France. He's, he's quite linked to France, but he's not included. It's one of these artists uh, for which I hesitated, but then you really need to uh, stick to facts. And um, I don't you know, just decide, oh, I'm including this one and not including that one. But uh, Saint Gaudens, Saint Gaudens? Saint Gaudens? Augustus Saint Gaudens. He was an American. <laughs> <laughs> I have not included him in, in the census. But for example, another one, um, more or less the same um, period, who is uh, Mac Monis. Mm -hmm is included because he kept a studio. He worked in France. He worked in France and kept a studio in France for maybe 25 years. So it does make sense to include him. But, her, yeah. her biggest worry was over Daniel Chester French. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one more. OK. Oh, OK. Yes, sir. Uh, Madame. Uh, I'm, a number of years ago, there was a documentary, uh, I think, called The Rape of Europa, which you know, seem to be familiar with, uh, which detailed the theft during World War II of hundreds, probably thousands of works of French art, painting, and sculpture uh, from both private and public collections. I'm just very curious uh, if, during your research, uh, you found any of the missing sculptures, uh, or do you hope to? No, I've not found any of the missing sculptures, but there are, um, I would say, at least two sculptures in American collections and one in the Metropolitan Museum of Art who were among the looted art. And um, you now have a lot of uh, information online. And so for this group, it's a 16th century, I think, or early 17th century group in, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art Collection. Um, I, I went really into detail in the provenance. Provenance in, in the records is one of the, the, the parts of the record that I cherish most because this is when you tell the story of how the object came to the US. And this is, this is and it's, it's, it's people. I mean, it's often you have people, and this is what is so interesting in the census. It's, it's not abstract. It's, it's a question, of, uh, it's a question of, of people, of persons, of individuals. And for that work um, uh, in the Met collection, I really went into detail into um, the date it was looted, the, the date it arrived, I think, in, in the salt mine, the date it was, it was sent back. And I think the best you can do for those type of works is to give information and be totally transparent and totally clear. I haven't found any... Um, Mm. You know, any, anything that would be, would be uh, not known of, but this is, this is typically um, something that I try to be transparent as, I don't know if I still have two minutes to talk, I don't know what time it is, but um, the other thing that I want also to be transparent about is deaccessioning. You know that deaccessioning is a, an American um, way of doing it. It is not uh, at all a French way of doing, because in France, the um, public collections are inaliénables, which means that you cannot sell them. And um, in America, you have a, a different way of doing, which uh, personally I quite approve of anyway. Uh, some, uh, some, and I try to obtain from museums um, the information about deaccessioned objects, and I keep them in, in the census because I think they are interesting from what they show of the evolution of taste. The census is also very much about the evolution of taste. And um, so deaccession, there is nothing you should be ashamed of. It's just something that should be very well uh, documented. And, and um, when the museums... I can sense that some of them are a little bit reluctant to give me the information about the deaccessioned objects. And once I was in the museum, and the curator told me, 
oh, no, that you don't look, need to look at that file because it's a deaccessioned object. And I thought, well, I do include the accession object. So this is, this is um, something that what I want to tell you is that I really want to be transparent to give the, you know, the, 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 the clearest information that I can have and I can provide. And I think everyone benefits of being um, transparent. So. Why don't we uh, continue our conversation over a, a glass of wine at the reception. So thank you all very much. Thank for you. Coming to the